Microbiology is the study of living things that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. Things like bacteria, fungi, and viruses. These microorganisms are so small they're practically invisible, but that does not mean they're unimportant. Microbes impact entire ecosystems and have a powerful effect on our health. I'm Science Mom. And I'm Math Dad. Today we're exploring the world's most dangerous diseases and the microbes that cause them. Good morning to Kaylin, Derek, and Claire from Abbotsford. And I see good evening to Winston and Yvonne watching in Switzerland and Italy. Hello, Tinley, Noel, Bree, Chris. It is good to see you guys here. I think they're ready to learn about microbes. We are learning about microbes today. So when we talk about diseases, a lot of times we're talking about things that are caused by germs. What right. are germs? But let's define they're, it real quick. They're microbes. They are. They're microorganisms. That means they're living things, although in the case of viruses you can debate whether they're actually alive or not, but they are little organisms that are too small for us to see with our eyes. They're microscopic. But which of these could be germs? Oh, because these are all those different domains of life we talked about. Yes. So we've categorized everything from viruses up to animals. These are the classifications we use to talk about living things. Which of these are germs? Type it into the chat or see if you can answer out loud before Math Dad does. Okay. And then just to clarify, so germ is just another name for a pathogen. I think we've called it in the past. Yes. So. And a pathogen is a microorganism that causes a disease. It can cause an infection and cause problems with the, how the body works. Okay, I know this. Viruses, definitely germs. Uh, bacteria are also germs. Uh, germs can be a protist. Yes, some germs are protists, and I'm seeing lots of good answers in the chat. Several people are saying that all of the first four are, but remember, archaea are also prokaryotes. They're prokaryotic cells, really simple, similar to bacteria in that way, but we actually don't know of a single archaea that causes a disease okay, that, that is a pathogen. I, that one I was less sure of. So that's why this one, we're not giving them a check mark. What about fungi? Can fungi cause diseases? Oh yeah, yeah, you could totally get something fungal. Yep, Noah, I see in the chat, Noah says fungi can cause disease. They definitely can. And okay, plants and animals. Can plants and animals cause disease? Like a rash from poison ivy. Well, they're not going to be germs. They can cause problems. There are certainly poisonous plants. There are plants like tobacco that can increase the chance of having lung cancer. And there are animals that are parasites. Things like tapeworms that can cause problems, microscopic animals. But usually we call these parasites. And you know, if it's a plant, we call it poisonous if it causes a problem. Mm -hmm but we don't call them germs. Gotcha. So plants, animals, and archaea, those aren't germs. We're not talking about those today, but these ones we are. And we're gonna go through examples of each of these four. Our first one, oh, but before we do, I wanna take a minute to just point out not every disease is caused by a pathogen. And here are just a couple examples of diseases that aren't caused by a virus, a protist, a fungi, or a bacteria. Heart disease is one of the leading causes of death. It can be really serious. And that's caused by a plaque accumulating in the arteries, so then the blood can't flow through. Okay, so it's just our body not working the way it's supposed to, a blockage in those veins. Now, we, this is technically not caused by a virus or a bacteria, but viruses and bacteria can increase, certain ones can increase the chance of heart disease. So it's not always completely cut and dry. Same thing with cancer. Cancer is your own cells growing out of control, right? Right. But certain types of cancer do have a link to a virus, where if you get a certain virus, then your chance of having a certain type of cancer can go up. So those can be linked as well. But here we have a really cool one. Cool, like not, you never want to get this or have <laughs> an animal get this, but just crazy. This prion, or prion, sometimes it's pronounced prion, these are proteins that can cause a disease. How can a protein cause a disease? Because this protein is not folded correctly. So see how we gave the, these ones like zombie eyes? 
and they're not good proteins, and here's the normal protein, and the zombie protein comes over and says, hey, do you want to change your shape to match us? And the normal protein, which is found in your brain and nervous tissue, says sure. And then they all clump together and they destroy nervous tissue. It's a terrible disease, causes mad cow disease in cattle, mm. or Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in human beings. But it's not caused by a virus or a bacteria. It's just a protein that is folded incorrectly. So the bad protein just bumps up against our proteins and they Some, fold the wrong way. Somehow causes them to change how they fold. Really bizarre and kind of Ooh. a newer disease that was discovered Diabolical. more recently. And then of course there are also genetic diseases where you have a mutation or some problem with a DNA sequence that then produces a disease. And that's not caused by a pathogen or a germ. Oh, wow. But now back to germs. Let's real quick talk about how things have changed with how we interact with germs, because there's been a huge change in the last 100 years. If we look at mortality rates, that means how often people died. From 1900 to 2010, there's been a dramatic difference. This is data for just the United States, but we see similar trends all over the world. So the total deaths per 100,000 people in 1900 it was over 1,000. But then, in 2010, look at that dramatic drop. It was about half of what, less than half. Yeah. So we say the, mort we say the mortality rate has dropped. The mortality rate has dropped dramatically, and how long people live has gone up. So the average um, life expectancy in 1900 was 48. In 2010, it's 78. That's almost doubled. Well, that, that, that's huge. Well, that's not almost doubled, but it's 30 years more. I mean, that 30 extra years of life. Can you guys imagine? That's, that, that's huge. Dramatic. Yeah. And, and you're right. I said almost doubled, but that's dramatic rounding that's not correct. Because if it doubled, then it would be from 48 to... To 96. 96. And yeah. 78 is not the same so as 96. Still, though, um, I'm, I'm glad to live now and not in 1900 when I look at that number. Yes. So people are living longer now than they did in 1900 and the deaths are much lower. And if we look at the cause of death, we see something really interesting. In 1900, deaths from influenza, tuberculosis, and gastrointestinal infections, that includes things like hepatitis A and B, those were really high compared to now. I mean, look at this, 262 deaths per 100,000, now down to 16, that's a huge drop. But with heart disease and cancer, we see the opposite. We see an increase. Uh oh. So how do we explain this? And if you're watching the replay, I hope you'll pause the video right now. And on page 78 and 79, you can answer real quick before you finish watching. What's your explanation for this? So what would cause more people to be dying of cancer now than <laughs> would have died in 1900? And heart disease. And why do we have such fewer deaths from tuberculosis and infections. Well, I, I felt more confident on the why are there fewer deaths question. So we, we've got better treatments now. We do, we have better medicines and we understand germs better. Got and vaccines. And in the year 1900, there were doctors that didn't believe in germs. They said, oh, I don't believe in things I can't see. That still happened in the 1900s. So we understand germs better. That's why all of these have decreased. But what about this increasing? I have a theory. And I see several great theories in the chat, too. And the one I'm seeing most is probably the one you're going to say, Math Dad. We're living longer. Yes. And because of that, the old age diseases are going to be more prevalent. Yeah. When people are living longer than when they get up into their 70s and 80s, there's a higher chance that they'll develop heart disease and cancer. But if they die from tuberculosis when they're 30, they never live long enough to develop um, cancer or heart disease. So these diseases are mostly increasing because people are living longer. That's an acceptable reason. I, I will allow it. So overall, <laughs> things are improving, even though we do see higher rates of illness from, from these things. Now, when we talk about influenza, the flu, we're talking about a virus. And I saw a couple questions in the chat about the most wanted posters. Yes, we're going to talk about these today, and I hope you will start on them. Now, a virus has a couple important features that you're going to want to include when you draw your wanted poster. Most important of all, a virus is going to have some genetic material inside, either DNA or RNA. 
my picture of influenza virus, I drew some RNA right in here. And then it's going to have a coating or an envelope around it, some sort of covering, and some proteins on that envelope. So it's like kind of like a wannabe cell wall? Yeah, it's a little covering. But this is not a cell. In our first unit of the class, we talked about cells and what makes a cell. Cells always have a membrane. This doesn't have the same features of a cell. It's much smaller and much simpler, and it can't use energy on its own. Remember, cells can use energy, and they can, you know, break things down. This can't do anything until it gets inside another cell and takes over. So here's influenza or the flu, and well, I want to talk just real quickly about this virus. Okay, so, so if I look at this poster, I just wanted to point, point out, you, you filled all this out. Yes, the, the... and when you make your wanted posters, you, I hope you'll research and fill out everything for the virus you pick. It doesn't have to be the flu. You can pick any virus you would like. And, and how would they find information like that? You're going to have to do some research. I recommend um, using Google, and I also recommend the Center for Disease Control website. The CDC has really good fact pages on all of the microbes that we listed in the appendix. So let's talk real quick about the flu. Because when people say the flu, a lot of times they don't mean influenza. Mm -hmm. You might hear someone come back to school after being sick for a few days and say, oh, I had a bad case of the flu. And they just mean they had a bad cold. Or they mean they got food poisoning and were throwing up. Sometimes people use the word flu for food poisoning, for a stomach virus, like a norovirus that causes you to get sick and throw up. Or they might call a cold the flu, but influenza is different. Influenza can be very serious. Some people will just have a mild case, but if you get a severe case, it comes on suddenly. Within just a couple hours, you will go from feeling fine to feeling terrible with a fever, body shakes that can be you're shivering so hard you can hardly talk, muscle soreness all over your whole body, and difficulty breathing and a lot of congestion. It can be a really scary infection. That sounds way worse than a cold. It is much worse than a cold. If you get a severe case of the flu, it's way worse than a cold. And it's also highly contagious. Now, every year we have the flu kind of circulate around, especially in the winter time because people are spending more time indoors. And in 1979, this is a true story that was documented. There were 54 passengers on a plane and the plane was grounded for three hours while they did a repair. One person on the plane was sick with the flu. And some of the people on the plane got off during the three hours, but some of them stayed on. And after three hours being stuck in that plane, a lot of people got exposed. How, what percentage do you think became sick? Ooh, okay, so t type it into the chat, your best guess here. So my guess is so maybe the people that were nearby, so like 30%, 20%. 20%. 20 20%, so just the people sitting behind and in front of this person would get sick? Yeah. I'm... And I'm seeing a couple guesses for much higher. Shadowmation says 95%, 96%. The answer is 72%. Well, that's a lot of the plane. It is. And they all became sick within three days of that plane being grounded. And then epidemiologists studied to see exactly what had happened and it, you know whether this strain was the same as the one the person had. And it really was most of the plane getting sick from just one person who had the flu Wait. because they were breathing the same air. It's like he coughed on him? Or? No, while the plane was grounded, the air filter was turned off to save energy. Mm. And so there wasn't a filter circulating the air and taking out the flu particles. And they're so small, they can hover in the air. So the flu is an airborne disease. It's transmitted through the air. And... The reason we see the flu every single year is because the flu doesn't just infect people. Influenza can infect pigs, horses, bats, ducks, all sorts of different animals. And it circulates through all those different animals and it mutates fairly often. So every single year we see flu outbreaks and some years are worse than other years. It just depends on which strain is the most common and how severe it is. And it can be severe enough that you could die. Yes, every year thousands of people die from the flu. 
Um, and there, so the reason we can't make, just make a vaccine and cure it is? Well, we do. There you can get a flu shot every year for the flu, but the reason we can't get rid of it completely is because it has so many hosts. It's zoonotic. That means it goes between different animals. Gotcha. So it's just changing so much that yep. no, this year's flu shot is going to be different than next year's. And it's, it's always going to be around. So we say the flu is endemic. It's a virus that is just always going to be circulating through, not just in human populations, but also in bird populations and bat populations and other animals too. So that's an example of a virus. But now let's talk about something that is different. And I want you to take a guess. See if you can answer before math dad does. Is this a virus, a bacteria, a protist, or a fungi? This is plasmodium. It's the pathogen that causes malaria, which is one of the deadliest diseases in the world. I know how it gets spread. Malaria gets spread by mosquitoes. It does. But when we're talking about this disease getting spread, what is it? Virus, bacteria? Protist, fungi, what do you think? Dancing Slippers says protist, and that is correct. It is a protist. That means that it is not a prokaryotic cell like a bacteria, and it's not a virus, you know, just a tiny little protein capsule with some, with some DNA inside. This is a pretty complicated cell, and it's big, and it has a lot of the same features that our cells have. It has a nucleus with DNA inside. It has mitochondria. You can see these little mitochondria that I drew here. And its life cycle is pretty complex because it lives both inside a mosquito and inside either a human or a monkey. And it goes back and forth between the two. And because its cells are similar to ours, does that make the treatments harder to come by? Yes, and we're gonna talk more about medicines in the next lecture, but because it is similar to us, this is what makes malaria such a hard thing. Because it spends part of its life in a mosquito, that means that it is confined to where its mosquito host lives. So if you live up in the northern or very southern parts of the world, this is good news because that mosquito can't live there. You don't need to worry about malaria. But if you live in areas where there is a very tropical, wet climate and this mosquito lives, then the incidence of malaria is pretty high. And I did mention that it's one of the deadliest pathogens in the world. In 2019, 400,000 people died of malaria. Mm. That is a lot of people. And again, sometimes it looks sort of oblong like this, and other times it looks round. It goes through a really complicated life cycle with lots of changes. But it is not a bacteria. It's a protist, Pro or oftentimes they'll call it parasite, a plasmodium parasite. You ready for our next one? Okay, Lyme disease is spelled wrong, but yeah, Lyme disease. Um, this one's caused by ticks, right? The ticks carry the pathogen, just like mosquitoes carried okay. malaria parasite. But what is it? Is it a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, or is it another protist? Okay, I think I know the answer on this one as well. This one's a bacteria. It is a bacteria. And this bacteria has a really unique shape. It is very long. We call this a spirochete shape. And because of its long, narrow shape, it's able to wiggle and get into tissue that other bacteria can't get into very well. So if you get sick with Lyme disease, it can be a really terrible infection. But it is not nearly as deadly as malaria because it can be treated with antibiotics. Now, if you get bit by a tick that has Lyme disease, usually there will be a circular bullseye rash. So that's kind of a dis distinctive thing. And this one, just like malaria, it's confined to where the ticks live. So Southern Canada and the Northeastern US, it's very common. Certain parts of Europe and Asia, it is common as well, but you're not gonna find it in, you know, Southern Africa and some of these other places because the ticks don't live there. So what does Lyme disease do exactly? It can cause really terrible problems with both um, your nervous system and your heart if it reaches its advanced stage. If it's caught early and treated with antibiotics, it's curable and you can get rid of it. But if it goes long term, it can cause a lot of fatigue and other problems that can last for years and years. So, so it's important if you live somewhere like 
like here, <laughs> you want to make sure that you often check for ticks and that you respond to any symptoms like this really quickly and see a doctor. Okay, last but not least, we have a disease that is caused by a fungi. There are not too many of these that are serious. Most diseases that are caused by fungi or problems that are caused by fungi are things that are annoying but not deadly, like toenail fungus or ringworm. They're things that are gonna cause maybe some itching or some discoloration, but they're not gonna send you to the hospital. But this valley fever can be more serious. You just made that up. I did not make this up. Valley fever is caused by a fungus that lives in the soil. And when it's in the soil, it grows like a mold, sending out these long filaments. But when the soil dries out, those filaments can break apart and form these tiny little spores. These spores are so small, they can get into the air and become airborne. And then if people breathe them deep into their lungs, they can start growing and go through this life cycle inside someone's lungs. This is not a disease that is contagious. If someone else has valley fever, they're not gonna give it to anyone else. And oftentimes, when people get valley fever, it just feels like a cold. They come down with a cough and they're sick for a week or two, but then their immune system knows how to get rid of it and they don't ever get it again. So, so it doesn't result in death? Not often, but it can. And we don't really understand why. For most people, it's mild. But for some people, it can be fatal. It, can, it kills a couple hundred people a year. And why do they call it valley fever? Because um, it is located especially in dry, arid regions. And when people first um, started to develop agriculture in the San Joaquin Valley in California, they noticed that they had these epidemics, especially in the summertime, of people getting sick with a bad cold and a fever. And they called it valley fever. That's how it got its name. Cool. But again, because it is a fungi that lives in dry soil where you have really hot summers and mild winters and not too much rainfall, it's mostly confined down here. Now on page 76, we're going to do, or 74 perhaps, we're going to do a quick little matching thing. See if you can answer these before Math Dad. Take out your notes if you've got them and follow along. Okay, so... The genetic information of this pathogen is covered with a stru structure known as a capsule or envelope. It has no ribosomes or true cellular structure and cannot reproduce on its own. So what are we describing here? Is it a bacteria, virus, fungi, or protist? It has to be a virus because it's not, not a cell. It doesn't have the cellular structure. That's right. Viruses, remember, there is argument about whether they're even really alive or not. That's describing a virus. What about a prokaryotic cell that can produce toxins? And for example, we have tuberculosis, E. coli, and salmonella. Okay, so prokaryote is what gives it away in this case because that means it has no nucleus. It means it, means it has to be simple. It's a bacteria because both protists and fungi do have nuclei. They're eukaryotes. That is right. And for the last two, our first clue is that most of these pathogens are not deadly and several can cause problems like athlete's foot, toenail fungus, or yeast infections. So you, that gives it away. You said fungus. Yep, <laughs> toenail fungus, I bet it's a fungus. Fungi. That is a fungi. And then last but not least, we have protists, cells that are eukaryotic like ours, and the example that is the most serious and the most well-known is malaria, which is spread by mosquitoes. So that wraps up our little matching in the notes there. And now we are ready for a under the scope mystery. Well, b before we get there, Science Monk, can I, can I ask a question about the project? Oh, yes. So, so we, we have an art project, and you even have your sample pages here that you, you were kind of showing off to us. So the, the, these are, are pretty cool. So we're supposed to draw it, make a poster, and fill out all this info. I hope you will all do at least four of these. But if you'd like to do more, you can do more. And on page 101 in the notes, there is a list where we have both the disease name and the name of the pathogen, because sometimes they're the same, like with influenza, it's the influenza virus, it causes the disease influenza, but most of the time they're different. And I want you to look up both of them. The Center for Disease Control website has good information, so does the World Health Organization. Those websites both have great information, 
pick a microorganism, look it up, draw a wanted poster, and then fill out these lines to describe it. So this is actually one of the more complicated assignments we're going to give this semester because you actually have to go read about it on your own and sometimes you'll have to read a whole article and there's tons of info there and you'll have to decide what is the most important what, what, what details should i actually include here and yeah have fun drawing it out and, and as a bonus here's a challenge for you make up a new microbe Ooh. and we know about the systems of the body and maybe the things that could go wrong because we've talked a lot about our immune system how would your new microbe attack a body what, what would what circumstances would it be what kingdom would it live in what what type of microbe would you make up that's great i hope you guys will give that a try camden asks how many copies of this do you need the template i would say do at least four but five if you want to make up your own microbe but I hope you'll pick a virus, a bacteria, a fungi, and a protist. Pick one of each type so you can kind of see how they compare and contrast. Okay, science mom. For our under the scope mystery, Michaela and Braden sent this in. Let us know in the chat, what is it we are looking at here? I will definitely comment on it and say it looks awfully cool. It really does. So the green color is definitely a clue, and then I can see what look like cells. Veronica says lime. Nolani says a fungi. Algae. We've got great guesses coming in. Leaf, Ooh, tennis, tennis ball. ball. Shadow Mason says aloe vera leaf, and that is correct. What? How did they know that? It is an aloe vera leaf. <laughs> that's, that's, it's an aloe vera leaf, so... Uh... So, so cool. You can zoom in on a leaf and see that because those, those were the individual cells we were seeing, yeah. right? Yep, those were the cells. Now go to itempool.com slash sciencemom slash live or if you're watching the recording, you can just wait until the video pauses. We've got some questions. All right, science mom. All diseases are caused by microorganisms. True or false? Mm -hmm. When we say the word microbe, is that just a sh short for microorganism? Yep, it is. And great question from Ella. Why do we feel sick when we get the flu shot? We'll be talking more about vaccines in a future lesson, but it's an immune response. So when you feel sick, some of it is caused by the, the pathogen. Like if you get salmonella, you know, you'll, you'll get pain in your stomach from toxins that that bacteria is producing. But sometimes some of the symptoms that make you feel miserable when you're sick are actually caused by your immune system. And that same response of your immune system that can cause inflammation and fatigue, that can be prompted by a vaccine as well. And you actually don't have a pathogen in you. It's not causing problems. It's just your immune system learning how to recognize a piece of that pathogen. Okay, science mom. Look at all these wrong answers. Oh, they're all saying false math, dad, which is correct. No, Good uh, job, see, unbeatable science kids. Okay. Th th this one is false, and it's false because there are diseases that are not caused by microorganisms. Yeah, such as cancer or autoimmune diseases. When you have your immune system attacking part of your own body, those can have a connection to a virus, but typically they're not caused by a pathogen. That's right. There are also genetic diseases mm -hmm. or even that crazy prion diseases. Okay. Let's see. Here goes. Which microorganism has no ribosomes or cellular structure and cannot reproduce on its own? Is it bacteria, protist, virus, or fungi? And then, great question from Noelle. Would we be able to stop the flu with masks? And mm. the answer is not completely. If, if people are wearing masks and isolating, that reduces the number of flu cases. And we saw that in 2020. The number of flu cases was lower. But especially because flu can infect pigs and birds, um, anywhere that people are interacting with pigs and birds and other animals, you could have new introduction of new flu strains. Gotcha. So. And is, coronavirus is not a flu, correct? Correct. Coronavirus is different than the flu, but coronavirus also can infect bats and other animals. So it has quite a few similarities. So our precautions against coronavirus actually helped lower the flu numbers. Yep, because they're both airborne. Gotcha. All right, we've got 51 votes saying that viruses have no ribosomes, no cellular structure, and cannot reproduce on their own, and that that's exactly right. So 
bacteria are also they're simple cells prokaryotes they, they have no nucleus but they, they definitely have a cellular structure and then protists and fungi are eukaryotes they're even complex cells okay malaria is caused by the plasmodium bacteria the plasmodium parasite plasmodium virus or the plasmodium fungi Mm. And then we have two great questions about malaria that were submitted that I think I can answer without giving away the, the answer. So when someone has malaria, and this is a great, good question from Ella, and a mosquito bites them, will that get rid of the malaria they have or will it make it worse? And the answer is, if someone has malaria and the mosquito that bites them does not have malaria, then that mosquito can now pick up malaria and give it to someone else. Mm. But it's not going to take enough of the plasmodium out to make a difference. So the person who is sick with malaria is not going to get any better. If the mosquito has malaria and bites them, then it could potentially make their infection worse if it's a different strain of malaria, mm. one that's more, maybe more, a little more virulent or powerful. But, but if their immune system is already attacking malaria, yeah, it, it might not have any effect. It probably won't have much effect. Gotcha. Okay. And then, good question from William. Do mosquitoes get affected by malaria when they're carrying malaria? Ooh. I don't believe they're infected. They're affected very much. I think the life cycle in the mosquito doesn't cause as many problems for the mosquito. It causes a lot of problems for the human beings who get it. Well, and if, if it's not in their bloodstream, too, then maybe it's different. All right. Good, good questions. You guys have me thinking here. And the correct answer here is it's the Ka plasmodium parasite. So this one was a protist. It is a protist. It is not a bacteria. Very different from a bacteria. It's a much bigger cell. It goes through several crazy changes in shape and in what it gets for energy as it goes through its big life cycle. Okay, select each true statement below. So most fungal infections are lethal. The flu virus only infects human beings, Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria, and tuberculosis is caused by a protist. So only select the true statements. And another good question from William, how are new viruses being found? Because there are new viruses being found. We call them emergent viruses. Sometimes they're found when human beings go to an area where human beings haven't been before in very big numbers. So certain really remote areas of tropical jungles, they might have bacteria that just we really haven't been exposed to before if it's a really remote area. So that's one source. But the other source is that viruses especially are always changing. And if they mutate and change enough, they can actually evolve to be different enough that we should give them a new name because now they're different than other versions of of them and coronavirus is a good example of that in our next course we, we will definitely talk more about those processes. how that happens yep okay science mom i think they're about to miss one see good okay. job so the only true statement there was that lyme disease is caused by a bacteria and tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria not a protist that one we just mentioned super fast so that was kind of a sneaky one yep but they almost fell for it Okay. And one more question. Okay, that's good. I did the easy questions first, science mom. Here comes the hard one. Select each true statement below. So, more people die of cancer now than 100 years ago. The flu is no longer a danger to life because of modern medicine. Average life expectancy has doubled in the last 100 years, or mortality rates have dropped drastically over the last century. Only select the true statements. I guess I said singular, but there could be more than one that's true. They could all be true. Maybe none of them are true. Ooh, that would be good. If okay. none of them are true, then haha, ha, you'll miss it for sure. Science puppy cheering for team unbeatable science kids. Go, go. <laughs> You've got it. Wow. Got a straight line. One category getting the most votes. Mm hmm. All right, I think we have a clear winner. Let's go ahead and reveal. All right. And there were two true yes. statements there. So more people do die of cancer now than 100 years ago. So even, well, though, even though modern medicine has gotten better, cancer deaths have gone up. Mostly because people are living longer now than they did 100 years ago. And mortality rates have dropped drastically. That is true. And then C, the one that had the next highest votes, life expectancy has not, not quite doubled. 
If it had doubled, life expectancy would be 96 years, and it's not quite that high. Still, though, I mean, it's increased by a ton, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's really something to celebrate. One, one of our biggest achievements as the human race is we've managed to figure out vaccines and, and healthcare and yeah, one of our one of our success stories. Antibiotics, yep. Now we have a fun thing for that Math Dad did. He tried to do a moonwalk. And I want you to give him a rating when we play this little victory dance video for the Unbeatable Science Kids. Give a five in the chat if you think Math Dad's ready to be a backup dancer for a band, a three if he needs to practice his moonwalk, but it still looks pretty good, and a one if you think, hmm, Math Dad, that's not a moonwalk. <laughs> Let us know how he did. All right, on a scale of one to five. And the ratings are all over the board, Math Dad. I see twos and ones. Ones? What? <laughs> Thank you, Bree, for the four. <laughs> <laughs> yes, got a four. And There's a five. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> see, Veronica says it was a five. I, I, I think the majority says that you need to practice more. I'm seeing a lot of threes. <laughs> Thank you for joining us to learn more about microbes, and we can't wait to see what you do making these wanted posters. We hope you enjoy researching your own pathogens and studying them. So if you post those on social media, be sure to tag us. We'd love to see them. In the meanwhile, work hard, grow smart,